First three bars. Go down. Can you do it? Probably not. Probably not? <laughs> Somebody want to try it? Right up like Somebody know this? Because I don't. <laughs> Wait, you're starting, you're just copying down? Just copying? Yeah. Oh. Wow, that's the easiest thing I've ever done. Someone's worked. Okay, can I play with your shirt? Someone's worked. Sure. Someone's worked. Someone's worked. College. Someone's uh, worked. You're starting you the wrong place. place. Oh, wow. <laughs> move yeah. your head to... Like, no, like, move over. Move to the Start from the left. No. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
He played at the Cotton Club in Harlem. Okay, we're good. My point is, every time we get a piece of music, all you guys always should look up the guy who wrote it and see what's up with him. See who wrote it, see what he is, see who he is. You may find a lot of interesting stuff out that way. That's how you become really good graduate students. Okay, so what do we got up here? What are these chords? D minor, D minor 7 to G7, right? Yes. So what do we see? First couple things, what do we see wrong with these, these chords, the way they're written? Two five. Two five. Okay. The first thing is, when you write a seven, here's a seven, right? This is a European seven. Oh, my bad. A European seven means what in America? When you write a seven, that equals a major seven. Really? Really? Yes. Uh, in New York and in Boston, they do that as a major seven. So what's the normal seven? I, major seven. Oh, uh, I know, but what does that mean? Just G7? Just G7, regular seven. If you go like this. That means one, three, five, flat seven. That's the G dominant seven, right? If you go like this. That's one, three, five, seven, that's G major seven. So people who write the European sevens always get a blend of, com of performers who play a major seven and some play a dominant seven. Uh, Greg, would you kindly play us a G7 with a G major seven on top of it? Yes. First play them separately. Okay. Play a G7. Yeah, great. Now G major seven. Now both together at the same time. Let it ring so you can really hear it. <laughs> yes, you guys should be crying now. Yeah, I like it. Oh. Sounds cool. Hear that? Sounds good. They should have that all the, all the yellow lights when they when they come on the intersection. A G major seven on top of a G seven. Now, how many bands do you think I've been in where the keyboard player is playing a G7 and somebody else is playing a G major 7 because it's written like that? Wow. Lots. Lots. Yeah. What happens usually is the, the, the conductor just goes, hold on, hold on, guys, wait, wait. All right, go back to bar 42. What do you got there? And he plays a G major 7 and the other guy goes, oh, I got a G7. And he goes, oh, no, 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 no. And then they fix it, you know. So, this is the this is the thing you want to avoid. A lot of guys will just think of it as a seven, but you don't know who's who or what's what. You don't know where they came from. You know, you don't know if they're from like some weird part of the country where the, their parents yell at them and say, "Leroy, get away from that wheelbarrow. You don't know nothing about machines." <laughs> okay, so. We want to go D minor 7, G7. Now, I know what you did was you just copied exactly out of the book, which is good. D-7, right? D-7 is how they write minor 7s in the real book. And that's how a lot of people write minor 7s. But what's the thing is, you, know, you want to make sure that the musician understands that you mean minor 7. A lot of these theory books will write minor like that. You know, the jazz guys write it like that. Uh, those two things, when you're writing for any kind of commercial music production line, you want to write M I, you know, or and if you use a capital M I N, just so the performer knows exactly what you. Dash, you know, lots of guys are used to seeing that, but there's some people who aren't. Likewise, they have this symbol for major. Only a handful of guys know what that means. G triangle seven. Oh, you know, what's, the, what's, the, what's this fraternity symbol, man? Yeah. Does this mean there's like a party somewhere today? Yeah. Well, for that, right? Okay, D minor 7, G7, and again, right? 
Now we get the same thing over here, E minor 7, A7. We can leave it like that, but I prefer the MI. Yeah. If you do a dash instead of an MI, that won't get marked down on the exam because that's what people use in the real book. And that's what all, if you go to a jazz gig, 99% of all the guys at the gig will have a real book. You know, that's like the, the given book that everybody works on. So that those minus signs are okay because 90% of the guys understand them now. But really, when you're writing for Hollywood, you're writing for orchestras, you want to make sure that the musicians don't have any questions. Okay, so what do we got here? D minor, G7. So what are our what are our red flag chords? The dominant sevens, right? Uh -huh. Yeah. Because there's only one per key, right? Right, so we got, here's the five, right? Here's the five. And here's the five, right? Okay, so if those are the five chords, the fives are something. G7 is the five of what, McKinley? C. C. So that means D in relation to C would be the two. 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 <laughs> okay, and once again, now what do we got here? A7 is the 5 in the D. key of D. D, right? Mm -hmm. And in the key of D, E minor 7 is two. regarded as the 2, right? Everybody with me on that? Yeah. Yeah? No? I'm looking to see if you understand. <laughs> so here we got the key of C. And here we got the key of D, right? Okay. So everybody write that in on their charts. Do the brackets over do the brackets over the whole key over the circle. Oh, this is a chart? It's really hard not to cross the seven. Really? Yeah. Okay, so just keep it up. Ten years from now, you'll be out of rehearsal, and you'll hear two people playing your chord. Somebody will play a G major seven, and some people, somebody will play a G dominant seven. And at the same time, if they're far enough apart in the room, you won't get that annoyed. But if they're close together, ah. Oh. that chord, right? <laughs> so, let's spell a chord. What's D in minor 7? D, F, A, uh, C. Yeah. <laughs> so we got one here. And we got one there. And we got a G. G. Yeah, 
now we change course, so we gotta go against the G. So, so two, right? So here we have a five, a five, a four, a four, and then this one, a one, one, and then a two. So there's the melody. Make sense? Mm -hmm. What about the next one? Right, we got a five. One, two, two. Now we go to the key of E. What do we got here? B, right? Which is the same thing, five, four, five. Five, four, A to a two, right? You guys write that in on your chart? Sense? Anybody confused? Mm. Is that the signal diamond? Yeah, more or less. Yeah, I guess so. Yeah. That's a new modern way to show you're confused. Just kind of shake. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Yeah. So the way that you analyze these charts is each note goes. To the, uh, you analyze it against the chord. In classical pieces, you analyze the note in terms of the key, right? But for these kind of jazz and pop charts, the notes go against each chord. Okay. So let's keep going. Sibelius that'll do it exactly like that now. Oh, okay. That exactly like that? Yeah. Oh, they, oh. Have, they have that real book font now. Oh, it's a all the original real books were all done by hand. Oh, and that's, they copied that font to make the font in Finale and Sibelius look exactly like the real book. But the original guys who wrote it were students who were, who were guys who were students and graduates of the Berkeley College of Music. They were jazz guys in Boston. And they were all students or graduates or alumni of Berkeley College of Music. And there was about four or five guys. The number one guy who wrote most of the real book was a guy named Alex Radulesco. And he was a guitar student at Berkeley and he graduated. And then he uh, was just trying to make extra money. And he was good at transcribing tunes. So he figured out all these tunes by ear and wrote them all out and sold it as the real book. And everybody bought it. He was, out, he was there on the street corner on Boylston Street and Mass Avenue with a box of these real books that he had Xeroxed off 
selling them for 20 bucks each himself on the corner and I bought one from Alex Radulesco and then after that he had a couple of other people who helped him upgrade the amount of tunes in there and then expanded and expanded and expanded until everybody got a copy of it by the late 70s everybody was using it and then uh, in the 80s uh, it was just like all over the place the real book and then Hal Leonard Corporation decided they could make money off this thing because everybody used it so they found Alex Radulesco and they found a couple of his friends in Boston and they actually went ahead and bought the real book from him and they contacted all the composers in the real book and obtained licenses from each composer and so now the real book is a legitimate publication that you can buy from Hal Leonard that has royalties paid to every composer that's in it. You see if you have a real book you'll see every tune has a copyright on it at the bottom and they pay the composers of the ASCAP and BMI royalties now. But so uh, was the guy not supposed to be selling them since he didn't have the copyright for the book? They were complete bootlegs from the dead get-go. <laughs> from the get-go, they were complete bootlegs. This is a, this is a bootleg copy. He he used to put down at the bottom the album that he got the tune off of. Okay. <laughs> he transcribed the whole thing, Alex Radulesco. and this is his handwriting on this. You know, this is one of the original author, original notebook. Uh, but it was a bootleg book. You know, I mean, but the problem is, it was just like viral. Every, everybody bought it. He couldn't, he couldn't keep it flowing fast enough. You know, he had, had to print so many, and he, then he had a couple, a few more guys involved because it just started to become this huge thing all around Boston, and then New York, and Philadelphia, and then guys from Boston would come out here and have this real book, and then people would go, "Where'd you get that thing, man? Can I get one of those?" You know, and it just spread so. Incredible, and how Leonard took over in like the 80s and 90s, and they, they started publishing it. Did he ever get in trouble? For like, no, 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 because the composers who wrote these tunes, they were all jazz guys, you know, and they weren't that vindictive anyway, and they thought it was cool that people would find out about their tunes through the real book. So there was no real, there was never was any kind of upset about it. it was, but it was like a double bonus because they started to get paid. Like in the 90s, when the how Leonard went in. to make it legit, they had to find every single person who wrote every song and sign a contract of license fee with them, you know, which you know amounts to maybe one or two cents a, a copy, but or one penny a copy, but it's still that's something in their pocket. They might get a, a check for 300 bucks at the end of a quarter, you know, yeah, or who knows, you know. All right, what do we get? E minor seven. So, what's the next chord? A seven, you forgot the A seven, right. Oh. 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 Okay. I didn't even, yeah, I didn't even. Okay, see Alicia. Mm -hmm. Now you're five, please. You can do it. You can do it. Did you go high up there? They have real book one, real book two, real book three oh, now. Just do it on the next one lower. <laughs> Where the last bar stops. On the second line down. Second last line bar. Like, second line down. like as if you were gonna continue mine, but just the line down. Right over here? Yeah. yeah. Oh. <laughs> Alex Radulesco also transcribes a lot of guitar stuff too. He has a few, quite a few transcriptions of uh, whole albums by jazz guitarists that he used to sell in Boston, same way. And I bought some of those from that guy too. I have, I have this. I'll bring it in. You guys can look at it. Yeah, I want to see it. And he's just this guy that graduated. He went to Berkeley and he graduated and he just started trying to make money selling. He was good at transcribing the tunes. He could figure it all out, you know. And he just wrote it out and started selling it, you know. Actually, I don't think that falls into copyright law because it's his own interpretation of the tune. Very good. Okay, now, bar number six. Bar number six. Who wants to do bar six? McKinley? Yeah. 
six positions and you look for that first position. Yeah, I have to say that. And that one is the worst one. I think you can better. I think there's a lot too. What? The first thing you do is like, you have to read a lot. Yeah, I know. That's what I figured. You guys hear it? We need some help. I don't want to take it. I have to ask. Is that a flat? Is it going to be? Yeah, it's a sharp. Okay, so what do we got here? A minor 7. That one's A, C, E, G. A, C, E, G, right? Yeah. Or a minor 7 flat 5, right? Mm -hmm. It gives you an option, right? So if it was a minor 7 flat 5, it would flat the fifth, right? Mm -hmm. So you could go. Yeah. Okay, 
So what key is this in? D. Yeah. Yeah, that's D. 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 Yeah. So this A7 is the marker, right? So that's D, right? Okay, here's the marker, D7. What key is that? G. 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 Okay, then here we have G flat, G flat right? Copy that onto your chart. Jessica. Jessica, can you come on up? 
Just do what? Just just do what? Oh, no. <laughs> just do You're just having conversations about how lost I am. Just I can't see that. Yeah, we're confused. You're just copying it. Yeah. No, he said to spell the word. You're going to spell the machine right now. Like, C-E-G. Like, like C-E-G. 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 Besides the piano, are using those notes as cues to play the chords, along with the words like above that tell them to what chord to play. Uh, the notes you're talking about, you mean the melody? Yeah. The other musicians are using the melody to play the chords. Is that where they're? The other musicians are just playing the, the piano and the guitar play the chords, and everybody else just plays the melody. Okay, but I don't get how that single note is making the chord. It's not. Oh, this single note is making a chord? That's yeah. where the melody is. Okay. This That's note that question. is played on top of the chord. Okay. Great. <laughs> All right. Great. Right. Playing this the chord, these three chords, but you're going to hit it with your right hand, you're going to hit the melody over the chords. The melody's in layers. Here's the chords underneath the melody. And then he's playing the chords with one hand, right? See, with the G in the right hand. change, but the note stays the same. So the melody is played and the chords go on underneath it. Okay. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Okay. Alright, so this is a good one. Alright, for C, what's G? That's the fifth, right? Yeah, sorry. So for E, it's the flat third, right? Yeah. And it's the same over the A, right? So what's what's it over the A? It's the flat seven, right? Wait, you're talking about the G? Yeah, the G. The G is the third of C, right? The G is the flat three of E minor, right? And the G is the flat seven of A seven, right? So what do we call that? That's the big lesson for today. I think it's called right now. Nobody, nobody know what that's called? Nobody? Wait, what's the type of progression? What is it? Oh, right up here. Yeah, it is. Yeah, it's like, 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 it's like
song and you have the melody, this is how you figure out what chord you want to have to go under it. Okay, Greg, would you please allow us to ask you for your permission to play some chords for us? <coughs> so we're gonna we're gonna hit this E with the right hand, right? Note E. Okay, so that note E, as a composer we decide we want to use that note E in our melody, right? But what chord do we want to have go under it? Where? Well, that note belongs to all these chords. A, C, D, E. Let's try. Let's try it against a uh, in left hand. Let's try that as the two. Let's try that as the D minor chord underneath it. That's a nice sound, huh? How about a uh, a D sharp seven? C major chord. So different levels of what? Different levels of tension and release. So the composer will sit down with a note or a melody and try different chords with that melody until they audition they audition the melody against all kinds of chords, and then they make a decision on what they want to do. And this is what I want you guys to learn how to do, is to figure out, well, I got this melody note, what chords do I want to have go under it? Well, here's a chart to, so you can figure out how that works. Does everybody understand how I got this chart? There's a blank stare, maybe? Maybe not. I don't remember. No? Okay. I just took the chromatic scale. And I figured out this note in the chromatic scale 
Is it this? Match it up with this chord. You slide it. And match it match up with this chord. Okay. So play that E again. Now play it again. So you get a G in the bottom. G major. So G major six. Right. Now go to a uh, an F major seven. To a G major six. There's a there's a good two chord little map. Try it. Uh, those two chords go together because that, that E, that note E, is plural to both chords, right? So this is a tool that songwriters use, it's note plurality. And that's what Duke Ellington did here. Thank you very much. Thank you. That's what Duke Ellington did right here. There's this, these, two, these three bars here. Note plurality. He had a note, and then he played these other chords against it, right? And those, those that note fit all those three chords, didn't it? So clever, 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 huh? So that's the craft of composing, is to figure out these little clever things. Now, to answer your question is, I'm going to cover that right now. All right, here's how we do this. Have a scale. Let's pick a scale. Any scale. C, right? Yes, sir. Okay. So now, to do chords, we use in our system of music, the first system is called tertiary harmony. Okay? Tertiary harmony, yeah. it's using every other note in a major scale. Okay. So we're going to go like this. Every other note in a scale creates a chord. So now what we want to do is we want to make a tertiary number line and memorize it. So a tertiary number line is going to be like this. That's a tertiary number line. Okay, so we derive that, Lindsay, from every other note in the scale, right? Jessica, right? So every, every other note in the scale gives us this tertiary number line. This is how we spell our chords using this tertiary number line, this tertiary harmony. What else do we find out with tertiary harmony? Well, tertiary harmony is the basis of our written music because we've got this, right? We've got in any clip. Here we got this, right? BDF, right? Isn't that part of the tertiary number line? <laughs> yeah. EGBDF. What about FACE? That's part of the tertiary number line, right? The tertiary number line rules the whole world of harmony, theory, and music. This is what you need to memorize right here. You need to, you need to know this the tertiary number line. Yeah? Yeah. You just like to raise your hand and distract me, huh? <laughs> he does that during jazz band. Like, like right, right before a song, we'll start playing and we'll wait, wait. Wait. <laughs> he goes, never mind. Oh my god. Right. <laughs>
That's so great. So, Lindsay, if you have a four note chord, it's always going to be these notes in order. Anywhere you're going to start. Anywhere you start. So, a four note chord of F is always going to be these four. A three note chord is always going to be those two. A five note chord is always going to be these five, right? Yes. So, when somebody says, a minor seven, the spelling is always going to be this. Okay. If somebody says G7, the spelling is always going to be this. Alphabetical order. But it depends on the quality of the chord. If you have a minor seven flat five, this is the spelling, but you have to take the fifth and flat it if it's a minor seven flat five chord. If you have a D7 flat nine, Here's the D7, right? Here's the D7 right here, right? And that would be the nine, right? So the letter name spelling would be D, F, A, C, E. So there'd be a one, a three, well an F would be a minor third, so we have to make that an F sharp. An A would be the fifth, a C, would be this flat seven, and the E would be the nine, so a flat nine would be E flat, right? Mm -hmm. But it's still based on the tertiary number line spelling of the chord. So the tertiary number line is what you need to memorize. So let's talk about an E13 chord. Kinley, what do we got? E, G, B. One, two, root, third, fifth, D, seventh, F, ninth, eleventh, thirteenth, right? Okay. <laughs> See how they spell it? See how it's spelled? Mm -hmm. Okay, this. That's an E13, right? So now, in an E13, do we want to use a major 13 or a dominant 13? Dominant. Dominant. So the spelling, the letter spelling is going to be E, G, C, G, we got to make that a G sharp to make it a major third, right? Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay, B is good. D is to E, that's a flat seven. E to F is a flat nine, so we got to make that F sharp, right? Yep. And then the 11th is A, and then the C, C sharp, C sharp right? How did that sound? Good. <laughs> See, you're going to lose weight at the end of this class. We've got to work out and come out of the chair like every five minutes, right? <laughs> okay, so this will lead us up to our next class. Here's the problem. How do you play all these notes? One, two, three, four, six, seven. You gotta have seven fingers, right? Use your elbow. No, right. Use six, your elbow. Six, uh, six, three. six notes. So what what do we got here? Are we how do you play it on guitar? Use your please. Albert? I don't know. Come on, you know an E13 chord, don't you? I know like E7. E13? You can't play it? Uh, like... You know E13, don't you? No. Okay. Hold <laughs> oh, oh, the chord. See, play, that, just play like a D. Thing. So you no, play 7 after Alright, so here's our problem. We got all these notes in an E13 chord. And even piano players don't like to play all 7 notes, right? So what do we got to do? Take out the five, take out the stuff, and uh, get rid of the third, the, the five and the eleven, and the one. Wait, wait, let's, let's look at this. Why can't we do this? What about triads? Don't we have some triads here? We get a triad here. 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 So we got E, G, B, G sharp, B, D, B, D, F sharp, F sharp, A, C. So 
So you could actually, on the guitar, play F sharp A C triad. We got F sharp A C, right? What's in the bass? E, right? section but another section can be playing a different triad and they can be in tune with each other it's much easier for them to hear each other's sections triadically as two triads as opposed to the whole thing making any sense yeah we're getting a little ahead of ourselves but that's polychords that's how you play them two guitars can play a 13 chord like that or you can omit tones on the guitar too we're running out of time okay so friday we'll see you guys out in the annex right who wasn't here today